Just open your Bible to John chapter 10 and keep your finger there or your mark or whatever. It's important for us to remember that Jesus Christ is connected to all the fundamental and essential parts of our lives and to life itself. He's central to everything. Everything. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact representation of his his nature. And the point I want to emphasize is he upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is not someone who's far away from us, although he is in heaven. He's near to us. Just as God has always been near, God and the Spirit of God is everywhere. So the presence of God is here with us. We don't have to have a special place to talk to him or we don't have to search for him as if we needed to find him. He's just there. And we need to realize that he's just there. In him we live and move and have our being. Acts chapter 17 verse 28. You and me live in him. A goldfish lives in water. It's in him. It surrounds him. It's his life. And just as the goldfish lives in water, so we live in Christ. He's in us. We're in him. And he is the life giver for us. Jesus tells us, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. So his idea in coming is to give us life. We have the physical life He gives us spiritual life through forgiveness of sins and a place in him who is the life. And because he gives us that life, even in the physical, he can enhance life for us, make it more abundant, make it more worthwhile, make it more productive for us, make it more fulfilling. And as in the physical, so in the spiritual. In the spiritual realm, we had disconnected ourselves from God through our sins and our rebellion. He reconnects us with the life source or the source of all life, the Father. And makes it possible for us to share in the life of God, which is, of course, the eternal, uncreated incorruptible life of God Almighty. So the impact of Jesus must be recognized by us. The impact on our lives, the impact on our well-being, on our present, on our future, on every aspect of living in this world and in the next. Jesus proclaimed, in keeping with this, in John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. We've got to understand that when this 
happened. Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience. For the most part. He was talking to a Jewish audience. That Jewish audience would have known that there was a background to this statement. And in knowing the background of the statement would have realized the full impact of what Jesus was claiming for himself. I am the good shepherd. Let us try and understand the background as we hear Ezekiel contrast or make the contrast between the self-serving shepherds of Israel and the good shepherd who was God himself. To do that, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 in the Old Testament. We'll read verses 1 through 10 first. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, Surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field, for lack of a shepherd, and my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I shall demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I shall deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be food for them. Now what we see here are leaders. <coughs> shepherds are called the leaders. There were the priests, the kings, the princes, the, the nobles, the judges, and all of those who were leaders in Israel. These shepherds had a responsibility. They were put there by God to serve the people. But as is the case with humans, we in our selfishness and self-indulgence get the grandiose ideas that those whom we are supposed to be serving should actually be serving us. Jesus had a different spirit. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many, he said. These people said, I did not come to serve. I came that you might serve me and give your lives a ransom for me. Polar opposites. These people used those whom God put in their charge for their own ends. <coughs> they enriched themselves from their poverty. They dominated them in every way so that they didn't have the freedom they should have had in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
They would kill the sheep in order to feed their faces. Truly, these men were not shepherds after the manner that God is a shepherd. And they certainly make a huge contrast to the true shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. In verses 11 through 16, God tells them, I'm going to intervene here. In truth, I have appointed you to do a job for me. But since you will not do the job for me and serve only yourselves, I will take charge of my flock. I will deliver them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. In other words, I'll do what you were not prepared to do. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. Listen to the true shepherd caring for the sheep. Not for himself. Not for his own well-being. Not for his own enrichment. Not to feed himself. He cared deeply for the sheep. And in Palestine back then, and even I believe in the present day, they can call the sheep by name. They know them individually. They probably have observed their individual characters. And they had a relationship, just as David had a relationship with his flock. So those shepherds would have a relationship with their flock. But the ones who had come before Jesus Christ, as Jesus says, they only came to kill and to maim, to steal. And when danger came, when the wolf came, they would run and leave the flock to the, to the wolf so that he could kill and maim at will. Because they were hirelings. They were brought in and they were doing the job for a wage. They weren't doing the job out of love, out of care for the sheep, out of desire to bring them to good pastures or bring them to water them at the, at the rivers or the wells. They were only interested in what they could use this flock for. But God says, I'll care for these people. I care for them. I care for these sheep. A good shepherd cares for the sheep. I know my sheep, Jesus says, and they know me. He not only knows them, he cares for them. He has pity on them and compassion and mercy on them. He binds up their brokenness. He heals our diseases. He is the one who looks after us on a daily basis. It's typical of us as humans to think of ourselves as self-sufficient. If I break my toe, I get it mended. If I get sick, I get the doctor. I pay for the doctor. I'll do what I need to do in order to get well again. But the, the overarching care and concern that God has eludes us. It's diff, it's, it's far away from us. We have to understand when we go down physically or spiritually, the Lord is concerned. The Lord cares. The Lord is the one that makes it possible for you to be healed. He's made provision through uh, the doctors and the nurses and the medicines and so forth that you will have the care that you would need. He uses instruments in life. But nevertheless, we've got to look back at the instruments and we've got to understand who is giving us our health and our strength, 
Who is giving us our well-being? Who is protecting us? Who has a plan for our lives? Who wants to give us life abundant? It's God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got to start seeing that and realising that. Because it's not left to us. It's not left to us so that we have to work it out. You can see from the Old Testament how, how the kings who are supposed to be serving God and trusting God, not only for themselves, but for the well-being of the whole nation, started to feel, oh, God's not in control here. We're being, we're being threatened by armies we will, we will get killed, we'll be overrun, we'll lose our land, we'll lose everything. We have to make an alliance with a, with a bigger nation who will come and help us to deliver us. Forgot God was in charge. And that nation, those nations who threatened, start to move in on the land People are killed, cities are overrun, and they come up to the very walls of your city, say Jerusalem for, for that matter, and they're threatening in every way to take the city and to destroy everybody in it. Would your faith, would your faith be strong enough to hold up under those circumstances? You see, if, if we don't come to grips with all of this and try and work it out in our heads, we're playing a game. We're playing church. We're playing being Christians. But we're not getting to grips with what really, it really means to be a Christian. That we live in Christ Jesus our Lord. He lives in us. He is our Lord and Saviour. He is our protector. He is our provider. He is the one who will deliver us. He is the one that will lead us through the paths that we have to take in this life and lead us in paths of righteousness as we take those different or make those different choices. He is the one that will save us and give us eternal life. But we don't like the idea of being sheep, do we? We don't like being told. We don't like being told off. We don't like being chastised. We don't like being told, don't do this, don't go there, don't do that. Because we're like kids. We're like kids. We want to be independent. We want to do what we want to do, regardless of what God thinks. Those who are humbly trusting God are listening very carefully and saying, if God tells me not to do this or not to go there, I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to go there. He's, he's saying these things for a reason. I trust him. I absolutely trust him. I want to walk in his ways. <laughs> Jesus could say, the Father's always with me because I always do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now is Jesus not the way for us? Is this example to be just discarded and for us to not, not give any consideration to it? Surely all of us, all of us should be saying, I know God's with me. I know Christ is with me. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Of course, he could say that because he lived for, for the Father. He communicated with the Father. He kept the Father's commandments. He desired to glorify the Father. He wouldn't even think on his own initiative as the Father has taught him. Those were his thoughts, and those were his words as well. He, in every way, he was totally dependent as a human on the Father. And that relationship that he had with the Father, we're supposed to have with him, or with the Father through him. So that we will learn the way of Christ. 
so that we will know how dependent on Christ we really are. Jesus is the good shepherd. He feeds the flock and he leads them to rest. He cares for the sheep. He has pity, compassion and mercy on us. He strengthens the sickly. He heals the diseased. He binds up the broken. He brings back the scattered. He seeks the lost. Jesus is a living Savior. He's a living Savior. And he was raised from the dead as the great shepherd of the sheep in order that he might perform his task to shepherd us through this life, to look after our needs, to protect us, to lead us to glory. Hebrews chapter 13, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, he says, Amen. Eventually he will come to claim his own as the chief shepherd. We know that from 1 Peter 5 verse 4. But in the meantime, we've got to prepare ourselves or live in the way that we as the sheep of Christ will follow him wherever he leads us. All of the promises of God to give us the shepherd and the king that was in the likeness of David and was a descendant of David are being fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you are still got your finger in Ezekiel chapter thir uh, 34, 23 and 24 are interesting. He says, Then I will set over them one shepherd, See, this was going to be the promise of the future now for these Israelites. My servant David, he says, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. In Psalm 78, beginning with verse 70, He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From the care of the ewes with suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hand. David had set the precedent. He had learned the hard way what it was to be a, a good shepherd. He did care for Israel like he had cared for the flock. He did, under God's guidance and through the Spirit of God, lead the children of Israel and guide them with a skillful hand. He truly was the, the uh, foreteller of the good shepherd Jesus Christ our Lord. In Hosea chapter 3 and in verse 4 and 5. Hosea predicts for the future again 
For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord, to his goodness in the last days. If the goodness of God is seen anywhere, it's seen in Jesus Christ and his relationship with the people he spoke to, with his interactions with them, with his desire to uh, help them see the truth of God which would lead them to eternal life. It was, that was the sort of man he was. And it's with that idea in mind that we will uh, rejoice, I hope, to hear that in eternity he will continue to shepherd us as his flock. Revelation 7, 15 through 17. Revelation chapter 7. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. These, hopefully, is us. We're before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. God will spread his tabernacle over us. They will hunger no more, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Peace and security that the good shepherd brings to the flock is so consoling, so uplifting, so hopeful for all of us that if we see that relationship that Jesus has with us and that we have with him as our shepherd, being his sheep, then we, will, then we will feel more at ease. I, I don't have to be my own um, defender. I don't have to um, be hostile to everybody. I don't have to work out every great and naughty problem in life. I don't have to um, seem like I've got everything under control because we don't. We play games. We don't. But what I have to do is to trust the shepherd who guides me, the shepherd who cares for me, the shepherd who will deliver me, and the shepherd who will lead me to those waters of life in the heavenly realm. Do you trust him? Is he your shepherd? If the relationship hasn't been this way, my advice is that we make it this way because that's what Jesus Christ wants. He's told you, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. He loves us. His self-sacrificial love has gone to the nth degree to save us. Will he withhold any good thing in his efforts to save us? No, he won't. We can rely on him. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. We can rely on him. I want to talk about Jesus saying in John chapter 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Jesus said to her, 
that is to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. I suppose we, we, we like contrasts, particular, particularly in pictures, the light and the dark, uh, the, the contrasts of colours, the uh, contrasts of personalities and shapes and sizes and so forth. Contrasts help us. They help highlight uh, what's being contrasted and we can see it more clearly. In our physical world, death and decay are all around us. I know we sanitize our society a little bit now, a little bit more than I think we should. We, all the sick are in the hospitals. So if you don't visit the hospitals, you don't realize the extent of the problem. The daily pressures on those who are working in hospitals is tremendous because the demand is tremendous. The problems are numerous. But because if you're Joe Soap and you've, uh, you've been, been pretty healthy, you don't have to go to these places. There are children, children who are having to get radiotherapy because uh, they're sick, very sick, they're dying. The old people we put in the homes, that way we can't see them. Not everybody does it, but enough do it so that we don't have to be involved with the older people, don't have to see how difficult it is to handle them, how the deterioration goes on and how it affects them, how the final last ga gasps are made before they leave this life. That's all. We want to keep that out of the way, out of our sight. But the truth of the matter is, the law of second, uh, the thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics is at work in life. Everything is dying and decaying. That's for sure. And the only thing that we, we know for certain is, in this life, is that I will die. I don't want to think about it. I want it to be a million miles away. But it's a fact. It's the only thing I can be certain of. I will die. You will die. Maybe you'll come to my funeral. Maybe I'll go to your funeral. I don't know what way it's going to work out. But one way or the other, whether I go first or you go first, we're all going to die. And in 50 or 100 years' time, there will not be hardly a one of us here. There'll be all new faces, if there's a congregation here at all in 100 years. We'll have to wait and see. So that's just how it is in life. In a poem called Death the Leveller, James Shirley says, the glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays it, his icy hands on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in the ground be equal made with the poor crooked side and spade. That was something I heard in primary school. It just struck a chord with me, I don't know why, just did. Uh, and, uh, but it's so true, you see. I think that's the, these, this is why these poems and that last, because they're so true. They, they say something that is everlasting. It's just the truth. So, whether you're a king on the throne, or whether you're a, per, uh, a pauper on the streets, when it comes to death, everybody's buried 
in the ground or your ashes are sprinkled somewhere <coughs> or contained in a box. That's the way it goes. That's the way it is. But even in the face of all of this bombardment of death and decay, faith still is able to say or speak of the resurrection from the dead. It seems impossible. It seems like, um, like you're just uh, believing something that's unreasonable, can't happen, it's never happened, as far as most people are concerned, and therefore it never will happen. But our Jesus said he is the resurrection and the life. And to prove it, he called Lazarus, who had been more than three days dead, out of the tomb. And Lazarus, at the word of Christ, came forth, bound with the wrappings that were on him, wrappings like a mummy. And he says, unbind him and let him go. That's what he proved. He proved he could do it. He even proved that he was the Son of God through his own resurrection. Was there any great man of any age or any time, any prophet, any priest, any king, who made everything about his success hinge on his death, burial, and resurrection? Anybody? Muhammad? Buddha? Anybody? Jesus did. And in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father, he says. Would you make the claim that you could raise yourself from the dead? Would you stake your whole career on you raising yourself from the dead? No, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. It would be foolish. Absolute nonsense for us. But Jesus did. And Jesus proved he was, in that way, the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. Um, I'm going to have to condense this part because... Um, Unfortunately, um, I spoke too long about the other part. But um, Jesus could say, I'm the resurrection of the life because he is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Let's look at John chapter 1. I we'll keep coming back to this, but it's so important. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you want to know who the Word is, verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word is Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning, and He was, he was with God and was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. Verse 4, very important. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The life that was in him was the eternal, uncreated life of deity. He was sent down from heaven as the Son of God to become man in order to die for the sins of the world. In John chapter 5 and in verse 26, he says, For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. Think about that. What life did the Father have in himself? The eternal, 
uncreated, self-sustaining life of deity. He is God. That's the life he had in himself. Even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. The same life as he had. The uncreated, self-sustaining, incorruptible life of deity. It's that life that created all things by a word that holds all things together. It is that life that can bring the dead back to life again. So that your death is not the end of the story. As a matter of fact, it's only the beginning of the story. Because you've gone then from the temporal, this life, a few years, into eternity, which is never ending. So that's why Jesus says, if a man, what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What if you were the richest man ever for all your life? What if you had businesses and houses and cars and power and wealth and recognition? What if everybody depended on your wisdom and your knowledge? What if it all centered around you for 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Will that ever compensate for losing your soul for all eternity? Ever? Weigh it up, brethren. See it for what it is. We're talking about everlasting life. Now you'll either spend eternal life with God in glory, peace, happiness, joy, and all of the wonderful things that God has given to give to you, or you'll spend it away from God in darkness and distress and misery and pain and sorrow. Easy. Easy to see which one is really worthwhile. But do you know what the majority are going for? You've got it. The hated suffering of eternal damnation. Jesus proved himself to be the Son of God through the resurrection from the dead. And in his resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says in verse 12, If Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. In other words, it's empty. There's nothing in it. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But of course, we don't have hope just in this life only. We have hope for the life to come. And that is, in the resurrection, God will have, Jesus will have come. The last day would have uh, taken place. The world will go up in fire. All of everything that has been created will be burned. Uh, there will be nothing left of the physical. We who are Christ will go and meet him in the air. Those who have rejected Christ will meet him at the judgment and there he will separate the sheep from the goats. And to the sheep he says, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Those are things that are fixed and irrevocable. The only thing 
that you can do about it is make the right choices now. Trust Jesus Christ to be your shepherd. Trust Jesus Christ to be the resurrection and the life so that you can have life in him now and have abundant life in eternity. Trust that he is the center of all life. He holds it all together. He is the creator of all life. But for us, he's the good shepherd. And for us, he is our life. And we should have nothing to fear from Jesus. He will do us only good all the days of our lives, both now and in eternity. Do you believe in him? Do you trust him? He's asking you to turn away from your sins. Will you repent of your sins? He's asking you to be baptized. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, he says. He's asking you to do that. And he will wash away your sins, forgive you of your sins, hold your sins against you no more, blot them out of his mind, remove them as far as the east is from the west, so he will remove our sins that far from us. He will accept you and make you a son of God with the promise of an inheritance of glory forever and ever. That's what's on offer here. That's why Jesus is so important. And that's why we should trust him. I'll leave it with you.